he was mentored more than 100 coaches to achieve their credentials with a 100% success rate. And I call this out specifically because credentialing and doing taking that journey is, is one important thing for all of us. And I see so much of conversation happening in the CJ, the coaching journey, WhatsApp community. So that's that's phenomenal. Uh, and, and I'm sure just by that, many folks are going to reach out to you separately and say, you know, what's the secret sauce? But thank you for doing this for us and, and welcome wholeheartedly. We are eager to um, hear from you. And I don't know if Neha Parashar has joined the call yet, but I wanted to call out a thank you to her for connecting me to you. And that's how we got uh, Daniel on board. So thank you, Neha, if you're there. If you're not there, whenever I spot you, I will, I will make a shout out once again. So on that note, um, Daniel, over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, so much, Kenneth. And thank you, everybody. This is this is truly an honor. This is this is wonderful. Um, a quick sidebar before I dive into the presentation. Um, 100% success rate that did not come without bumps along the way. And one of the things I learned in how you achieve a 100% success rate is know the ICF rules better than they know them themselves. And recognize that while the core competencies are there and it, it appears to be a very objective process, there is no end of subjectivity that comes in from each evaluator's listening in how they listen. So it's, for me, what I've learned over the years is be really clear in contract setting and it makes everything else just so much easier to be able to push back if we have to push back. I learned that in my PCC call because one did not pass. And when I read the review, like, eh, something's not right about this. Made notes, sent them a, a really rather nice, but somewhat terse letter and said, I disagree. I would please like to have another review. On the second review, that call not only passed, but it wasn't like one that just got pushed over the line and said, don't bother us again. It went night and day. And that's when I really learned how much subjectivity does come into this process. So recognizing that, how do we make it as black and white as possible that the competencies are hit in a way that also feels conversational? Because when you try to hit the competencies, you're thinking about the competencies not being present with the client. And that's that's when things fall apart. So thank you for that. And it has not come without bruises, I will say that. But let's dive into the three A's. Um, my, as Daniel, you may have already- Sorry to interrupt, Neha is there. I just wanted to uh, call it out for her because this wouldn't be possible. So Neha, if you could uh, turn on the video, I just uh, would like to thank you for connecting us and um, having Daniel and for us all to have the privilege to hear him out today. So Neha, if you're there, uh, maybe just a quick shout out and hello. I don't want to shout out where I am right now, but <laughs> okay. shout out for you, Kenneth, and for you, Dan. Thank you for making it today, Dan. And thanks, Kenneth, for organizing this. Uh, I've been wanting to hear this for a very long time. So guys, I've done this for a very selfish reason. <laughs> but you are, you all are very, very welcome to the party. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, sorry to uh, interrupt, Daniel. All yours. Now I'm quiet. That that was awesome. And selfish is one of the best things we can possibly be. It gets a really bad reputation, but think about what we tell our clients to be in charge of their life. Sometimes that requires a level of selfishness that is not self-centered, but in a way selfless. And we have to come back to us to prioritize. There's nothing wrong with being selfish, particularly when you share your selfishness with a community. That's that's really not selfish in a way. <laughs> so as you may have already guessed, my presentation style is rather um, collaborative. So I'll be in and out of the slide deck as I go through. We're going to move relatively quickly through <laughs> the information, but I will be bouncing in and out to throw questions to create conversation. And let's uh, let's dive into it. So the three A's, adjectives, adverbs, and absolutes, these are all qualifiers that, oh, we'll, we'll get to that, that come from the client's personal experiences and or expectations. Um, Kenneth did that wonderful, wonderful introduction. Um, so I'm a guy who's done some stuff. That's all, that's all it is. I want to dial in on that last 
paragraph here that I believe in the true superpowers of coaching are presence, silence, and skeptical curiosity. As we're having a conversation about qualifiers, adjectives, adverbs, and absolutes, do you notice the adjective there? Skeptical curiosity. How does that change it? What's different about skeptical curiosity versus just curiosity in your mind? We'll do one or one or two. Anybody have some ideas there? Skeptical is double curiosity. Mm -hmm. Being curious yep. about being curious. Mm -hmm. Yep. And what else? What else comes forward? Is that skeptical next? means uh, uh, not completely agreeing just what I said, just uh, challenging it kind of. Yes. Perfect. So between the two, the extra level of curiosity and then that, that challenge moment. Um, thinking about the uh, the, the five agreements. The fifth one that was written by Don Miguel's son was be skeptical, but learn to listen. And skepticism tends to be, I don't believe you. But in this sense, I think everybody in the room has been doing coaching long enough and serving others long enough. There's that level of the problem that walks in the room is not really the problem. It's the surface conversation until we get that deeper dive into what's really driving this and how is the person really driving it? So that that skepticism is not, it, there's there's a level of, I'm, it, I don't wanna say this, it's not that I don't believe them. I know there's something else underneath. And that brings in that double curiosity of what's really going on here. So embracing skepticism in that way that, I know what's in front of me is not really the thing. And how do we, how do we pull it out and pull it deeper? Thank you for the spot, spot on. So they're all qualifiers that offer an opportunity that dive deeper into evoking awareness at a personal level, because clients, all of us are creating our reality through our language, how we are speaking about it, which brings up is either driven by or might elicit an emotional response, but it comes from our beliefs, either expectations or prior experiences. We could all be in the same event, which strangely enough, we are, look at that. There's going to be so many different ways. There's 35 of us in this room right now. There may be 35 different descriptions of this event at the end of it all coming from personal experience yet we're all experiencing the same thing so the objectives to understand and apply here the power of inquiry and exploring and before i go further than that let's just call that let's call some icf definitions to the room right here the difference between those two words inquiry and exploration this comes up a bit more in pcc qualifiers than in acc ACC is more of, if we look up the food chain, ACC, really evaluation there is looking for facilitation of the problem. Client comes in with an issue, we help them to discover awareness and solve the problem. At PCC, it becomes a little bit of a hybrid. There's the problem that walks in the room, and then we're looking for the emotional words, the belief, and we do the dive into the person. At MCC, the expectation is you are coaching the person and in your intuition, the entire session. So that, that becomes a bit of a distinction between the three levels. Very different listening levels as you go through the, 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 the levels of credentialing. And in the PCC um, markers, there are some, some markers within each of the core competencies that will say, coach inquires on the client's topic or use of emotion. Inquiry is one question only. Tell me more about that feeling of insert word here. Exploration is going two or three questions deep on that same emotion. So we're building out more information. And as I said, some of them require inquiry only, some require exploration, and they're, they're, they're clearly called out in the list of markers for that credential. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
trying to understand how to maybe help our clients shift new awareness around their qualifications. And we'll get into that as we dive into each of the qualifiers. And that will present us an opportunity to shift from what focused, more problem-centric questions into more who-centric, or as Marsha Reynolds would call it, more person-centric, coaching the person, not so much the problem anymore, to discover why they're choosing it. Where is that, where is that qualifier coming up from? and what's driving their use of it, that could be an opportunity to expand awareness. So as we begin, adjectives qualify nouns. We're gonna go back to elementary school here with some basic understanding of grammar. How, how boring could that be? Qualifying nouns, so the item being discussed. There's physical objects and there's physical qualifiers to begin with, that maybe a blue car, Maybe the qualifier doesn't mean as much here, but it might. A hot grill. Stay away from the hot grill. Walk walk all you want toward the cold one. That's perfectly fine, but stay away from the hot one. Cold water, leather shoes, different than plastic shoes or rubber shoes or um, just the sandals I was wearing this morning are more of a rubber to walk outside. So does it matter? Not so sure on that one, but it might. Maybe it depends on how they in tone the qualifier that client might say i really want to have a blue car extra little emphasis on the qualification so i noticed some tone change there what's important about having a blue car to you and it reminds me of the last company that i worked for before i ran away from corporate and came into being an entrepreneur and doing the coaching thing serving others um the car company Chrysler here in the U.S. back in the late 90s, early 2000s, produced a car called the PT Cruiser. It looks like an old coupe from the 1930s, had curved fenders, really rounded nose. It, was, it looked like nothing else on the road except a car that was 60 years older at that point. And the guy who, who built the business that I had worked for, he, he had passed before I started working there, but I remember his wife telling me, that when that car came out, he had to have a black one. He had to have a black PT Cruiser because it reminded him of the cars he drove in his youth. So there then becomes this emotional connection back to his memory of what brought him joy 50 years or so earlier. And maybe it's the qualification of a black car. Or if we think about car, does PT Cruiser become the modification of car, depending on where we, we chunk up the nouns and the things to discuss there. But it, it, that car meant a lot to him. Um, when I was working for them, it wound up being my company car, which was a very nervous place for me to be driving in because I know how much that car meant to him, which meant it meant that much to the family, which meant don't have an accident <laughs> because there will be all kinds of terror if that something happens to that car. But what happens when the client's choosing their adjective from experience rather than physical description? So either the noun or the adjective could be theoretical conceptual. We're going to dive into this a bit more. So ideas of theoretical, theoretical adjectives, a loving spouse. What's, what's this concept of loving? How would you know that the person you were with had the quality of loving? What does it mean to have a toxic boss? Everyone might describe toxic a bit differently. A caring organization, an ideal partner. We're going to dive into that one in a couple of slides. A disappointing menu. Really looking forward to this restaurant. Maybe it was rather disappointing. What made it disappointing? Maybe coming from expectation of what they thought it would be or... It looked really good on the menu, but when, when the plate came out, it was not what it looked like in the pictures. Here, the qualifier might be more important because it's coming from this idea of what should be. As I built this idea out, I came up with this grid of physical to theoretical to get a, get a little bit of the concept. The physical noun with the physical adjective, blue car, hot grill. There may or may not be something to explore there. Don't know. As we move the physical noun to the theoretical, the ideal partner. Now, what is important about ideal partner, person? But what's this quality of ideal? How is it different than someone who maybe isn't ideal or 
improve they've experienced in their dating life at this point. As we move up to the more theoretical, $1 million idea, there's a bit of theory in, or excuse me, idea. Tell me about idea. What is this idea that has a physical adjective on it of a million dollars? We know what a million dollars is. We can put a pie, we can put a pile of cash or a, see a bank deposit or see a bank balance. Here is a number. What's the idea that goes with that number? Um, I don't know if, if this show ran internationally or not, but in the mid late eighties through the mid nineties, there was a show here in the U S called lifestyles of the rich and famous where Robin Leach is a host. It was, it was the show of the, the affluence of the eighties, <laughs> all the big houses, all the celebrities, all those people are like, here's their yacht. Here's their mansion here. Here's their mansion over here. Oh, and by the way, they have a third mansion that we didn't have time to show you. So it's all about this excess. The host, Robin Leach, with his wonderful British accent, closed every show with the same phrase to the viewers. Wishing you champagne wishes and caviar dreams. Here's these physical qualifiers on an idea. Champagne wishes, caviar dreams, affluence. How would that be different than him wishing light beer wishes and hot dog dreams? Would you really want that for yourself or for someone else? What's the idea that we connect to when, to champagne and caviar versus light beer and hot dogs and hamburgers or something like that? Very different ideas there in what you want to present to someone. And then we come over to theoretical, theoretical, a bright future. What's the qual and where would we go with that? Is it the, the exploration of what would make it bright or what is making it possibly dark right now, or at least cloudy. And then what is that future? It's, it's out there in the distance to be described. So in these cases, we might want to explore the qualifiers. Tell me more about the concept of ideal when it comes to what you want in a partner. How is ideal different than your life currently? Maybe Maybe we do a counterpoint if they're if they're looking for the ideal. What's happening right now? And then what is that gap to be closed? The change in behavior, the change in belief that creates the change in behavior. And then to attract or manifest your ideal partner, question of supreme ownership, who do you have to be? Kenneth, go ahead. Yeah, then we're um, losing your voice in and out and generally it's Ooh. it's very soft so at times we hear you very clearly okay we're, yeah it's um if you could probably just check that out i'm going to make a quick change to my headset thank you I, I, right there. I think it's something from the computer because every time you're putting up the slides something shifts in the way we are hearing you yeah thank you Anne. okay i'll be i'm gonna swap headsets Where is it? Okay. How is that? Is that? Uh, yes. So, uh, much better. Excellent. Awesome. Excellent. I just changed the setup and I'm still working through the, working All through right. the bumpiness of it. I thought excellent. I, I had uh, intervened earlier, but I was more thinking, is it my end? Uh, but thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. You're very welcome. No problem at all. Excellent. So I always keep a spare set handy. So this idea of ideal an ideal partner and to to attract your ideal partner who do you have to be that comes back here it's not about the person outside or the thing outside of us anymore that the, the client might be giving power to now it's ownership and that takes me back to probably my very first client who we had been doing a lot of work together they came into a session rather down energy kind of despondent because they hadn't they'd been dating someone it didn't work out and low energy i really want to meet my ideal partner um 
we did a future pacing into that uh, ask permission to do the visualization who are you when you're with that person imagine it and very like tell me about you in that moment very high energy oh i'm happy i'm sh all the great things in life came back to the moment after the after the exercise and asked so when we explore when we look at the concept of that person that you want to meet who are they looking for are they looking for that version of you or the version that's sitting in front of me right now and suddenly it was oh i get it um, I, i'm getting some background noise coming through is is there a, a mic open by chance okay. oh, got it okay <laughs> awesome um which version and they suddenly realized that in wanting to be that happy person they were stuck in a space of i don't want to have what i want right now and looking in a way kind of looking for someone to fix that for them so they could be happy rather than recognizing the internal state of happiness comes first and that person was really was not looking for someone to fix they were looking for someone also to be happy with in a mutual pairing that was a game changer in that session. Um, wasn't too long after that that they met the person who they wound up being being partnered with. All right. So not so obvious are these that qualify theoretical concepts, right? Future lukewarm reception. That's you're still being received. What makes it lukewarm instead of a warm reception or a cold? A great or a bad idea? What makes the idea great or bad? What makes it a $1 idea versus a million dollar idea? And then this idea of a smooth transition, we wanna move out of one thing into another. Sure, the transition is going to take place. What's important about it being smooth to the client? And then back to ownership, what's, what's in their power to make it smooth? Recognizing that no matter what, there are always people and situations outside of their control. You can be the nicest person in the world and someone will not receive it that way. And what's in our control pretty much say ends at the outside edge of our skin. We can push a button. That doesn't mean the button is going to work. We can hit the accelerator in our car, depending on what's going on in the engine. Doesn't mean the car is going to pick up speed. Or it, might, it might just go boom a little bit before it goes and runs. Control ends right here. We could also have a much larger debate and conversation because I love this stuff of what do our thoughts control and what do our thoughts create? That's a fun exploration, but not, so, not for today. I have a cat scratching at my door who wants to come in and hear this presentation in the worst way, and it's really distracting. So let's play with this one for a couple of moments, an idea of I want to be rich, filthy, stinking rich. Where would you start? Because rich is a vague concept what I call the I want to be rich statements, the things that seems like they say everything but really says nothing at all because it means something different. There's 8 billion def definitions of I want to be rich on the planet. And then filthy and stinking are qualifiers of that vagueness. Maybe they bring a little more detail. Maybe they don't. Let's just play with this one for a moment or two. Where would you start if a client coming in wanting to, maybe they want to be an entrepreneur, they're building a business, or they just have an idea of, I want to win the lottery. I want to be rich, filthy, stinking rich. What, what comes up for you is where you would go. Can we just come off mute? Yep, yeah, that works. That, okay, hi. And um, I don't know, maybe starting with um, inquiring as to whether there's someone out there who's already embodying and experiencing that. Is there someone that they aspire to be? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, the ideal avatar out there, because we can't admire someone unless the same qualities exist in us. So we get the exterior template and then discover the qualities inside. Absolutely. Any other ideas? Does it mean by that, uh, the thinking, yeah. So thinking about rich, is like, oh, that, that would be wonderful. It would be the greatest smell of roses ever. But here comes this qualifier of filthy stinking, which, which might be more dismissive in energy. 
And that same question got asked to me in one of the first presentations of this program. Like, so what is it about, what is it about rich that makes it filthy and stinking? And I had to sit back and think for myself, where did that come from when I was writing the presentation? And I suddenly realized it came from my childhood because I grew up in a family where both of my parents grew up during the depression. And there was a whole lot of what is known as blue collar lament that it's better to be poor and honorable than to be affluent in any way, because the only way someone can be affluent is to cheat someone and be dirty in their business deals. There, there comes the qualifier. And suddenly realized that this is very much a therapy session for me as we were having that discussion. But that that drove it home. Suddenly, this thing that I was using as an illustration came from me and a 55-year-old memory of hearing that repeatedly through my childhood. And it's just floating in the ether for me to pick up and drop into this presentation as an illustration of this concept where it's just there. And now that I know it, like I don't necessarily want to, I get the idea of it, but I might now choose to put a different qualifier on it than filthy and stinking. Or I find something really fun about filthy and stinking and make it work. All right, as we move now from adjectives to adverbs, we're moving from qualifying things to qualifying actions. And Stephen King in his book on writing, The Memoir of the Craft, which is really his discussion of writing his, his first bestseller, um, Carrie, way back when, the adverb is not your friend. I believe the road to hell is paved with adverbs and I will shout it from the rooftops. He feels about adverbs the same way that Hemingway did. They're lazy writing. And as a writer, yes, totally get his perspective. Let's think about where we started this conversation today. Words create worlds. Our clients are creating their worlds through the words they're speaking, through the words that are going through their thoughts. And for a writer who's building a world in a book or you know, that we'll say a book, but you could read it on screen. They're creating an experience for a reader to drop into and be immersed. One word doesn't do it. The day was warm. Okay. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Tell me more. It was incredibly warm. Oh, uh, that makes it just a little bit more. Um, one of my favorite writers at this moment is a guy named Jonathan Carroll and he writes magical realism his most recent book came out last year and I read it in December, it was very moving. And I sent him an, a message through Facebook Messenger saying, I really enjoyed this book, brought up some things for me, just wanted to share it with you and thank you for the, the, the writing and for everything you've written. And surprisingly, oh, there's a qualifier. He wrote back and said, in, thanked me for writing to him and how much it means to him that his, his work is having impact. And he said something I had not considered before in that he wrote something, I should say. Um, all books are essentially a conversation between the absent, the writer and the reader. And I had never considered that before. Here is the writer at a point in time writing, creating for the reader many months or maybe years later to experience that creation. The two parties are not together. And that's where the immersion comes in because we can't build it out in conversation of exploration with the way we can in a coaching call or a coaching session. Here's the detail, everything that the writer can put down in that moment to build the world as much as they can so that the reader can immerse into it and begin to get those feelings for the characters. Carol writes characters better than any other writer I've ever experienced. You really, you begin to care about the people in their lives. It's heartbreaking when things don't work out. And I started thinking about that. That's important for a writer, but how do we as individuals shorthand our word in creation? So let's dive in a little bit. The child screamed. Maybe right now you have an idea. Maybe maybe you hear a sound in your head that you would put a qualification to. Maybe it's one word. For King, wanting to immerse someone into a story might 
might write something like, as the wail of sorrow reached its sonic pinnacle, it reminded me of the shriek of a banshee from my childhood on the moors, soul-curdling, heartbreaking, and terrifying in its existential recognition of ultimate solitude. My apologies to Mr. King for attempting to write something in his style, and it probably says something about me that I went that direction rather than another direction, but again, maybe it's a therapy session in the future. The thing is, nobody's going to talk that way in conversation. And did you just hear the absolute, which is our next section of this presentation? A few people will, writers will tend to talk this way. Everyone else will tend to say the child screamed unhappily or excitedly. Now we have the opportunity to explore unhappily or excitedly. What what was it about that sound that you decoded as unhappy or excited? As I've already said, they qualify actions. A hotly contested football game. It's, it's already being contested. What made it hot? Sneaking around secretly. Isn't sneaking already secret? What, what doubles up there to make it even more clandestine? Warmly received or coldly received? It's the same thing. Why does one person feel it warm and like welcoming and the other's like, well, they just kind of said hi and kept walking. What was that about? But they both received it the same way or coldly rejected or warmly rejected. Same action. What's the difference? And that one takes me back to my career in my 20s when I was looking for looking to change jobs along the way, sending out the resumes, same stuff that goes on today probably a little bit colder today because of all the interference of technology in it. But my boss used to call them the TBNT letters, which stands for thanks, but no thanks. Wonderfully warm letters of, oh, thank you so much for applying for this position. We really are impressed by your qualifications. Unfortunately, the position just doesn't, it, we, we've chosen someone else at this time. We wish you the very best on your continued search for a new career. Oh, that feels great. They really care about me. When really it's like, um, yeah, we found somebody else. Keep going. Well, they could have just said, yeah, yeah, thanks, but no thanks. But they did it in a warm way. Um, Churchill had a has a description of it's called a certain form of diplomacy and which is a way to tell someone to go to a certain very hot place in a way that makes them look forward to going forward to the trip. He just had that ability. Um, so think about words and the intention of it for church. I really want you to go away, but I'm going to make you look forward to going away. So some adverbs, particularly there's an adverb that come from theory, come from this client's sense of self and experience. These can be powerful avenues of inquiry and exploration. Ideally, ideally, I'd be making six figures by now. Ideally is the dream state. It hasn't happened yet. It is still an idea. Now, how do we make it real? Versus the other side of that, that continuum, Realistically, I'd like to be at a three by the end of the session doing maybe a reverse scale of one to 10. Realistically comes from a sense of what's possible based on prior experience. It might come from a limiting belief that is sabotaging the client's potential outcomes. This is what I've experienced up till now in life. And this is what I think I can, I can do realistically versus my dream is to be here. And this was an actual coaching conversation. We began the conversation, the client was at a stress level of eight, really heightened sense of stress, tense. So yeah, scale of one to 10, where would you like to be at the end of the session? Realistically, I'd like to be at a three. There was something in the way they stressed realistically. Realistically, where do you really want to be? Well, ideally, I'd say zero. Okay, we got three, we got zero. What's our target for the session? And they said, let's go for the zero, see what happens. In 15 minutes, even though the client didn't think it was realistically possible 15 minutes earlier, we were at a zero by diving in deeper. Now think about that for a second. In setting the session contract, we thought, what's our topic? Let me explore it a little bit. What do you want to get out of the session? So we have that session marker for success. So we 
you know, in some way we've delivered value or we've gotten closer to that marker. Client thought three was the the only the the real thing. Decided to go with the idea of let's let's see if we can get to a zero. And we as coaches know we don't have to hit the marker in every session. That's a whole lot of pressure, but it does give us a target to kind of drive through. It's, it's a destination point. As long as we're closer to it, we don't have to arrive in that town. What, hap what would happen if we only got to a two? We're still 30% better than what they thought was real 15 minutes earlier. If we get to a one, that's a 66% improvement over what they thought was real. What could that open up even though we did, we might not have gotten to zero? How is the client creating the sense of limitation of what's possible in the future based on what they've experienced up to this moment? So does the past create the future? Sometimes it does once we become aware of it and how we're putting limitations on what was and what has been up to this moment what can we change going forward? What's that bringing up? I just want to kind of check in with the room here really quick. And is there any quest or are there any questions coming forward in this moment? I have a question here, mm -hmm. uh, Juanita. So uh, when the client starts explaining their first statement or first time they're explaining their issue, and they come up with so many qualifiers, so many adjectives. So how do you pick and choose which is the adjective that you know we need to inquire upon or we need to explore? How do you make that choice? Uh, do you leave it to the client to make the choice or do we pick the trail of thought? How does that happen? I'm going to answer it in two ways because it might, there could be some some difference here in listening. If they give me a laundry list, if they, give, they really give me a lot, and they all seem to be intoned in about the same way, I'll most likely reflect them back and ask which which one is it, or is there something that holds them all together? Or maybe as I'm hearing them all, if I hear, if we imagine them all as a Venn diagram, there might be like an overlapping term in the middle, maybe, and I'm hearing a different word than the one they sense, but it seems energetically to link them all, I might reflect them all back and say, kind of what I'm hearing in all of this is this word. How does that land for you? So sharing without attachment, which is, again, part of the PCC markers, I don't want to say, oh, so what I'm hearing from you is really this word here that sums all these up, right? Let's go with that. That would be the coach coming in and leading and directing from our filtration of the of the event so i might reflect them all back and ask is there something that holds them all together or is there a is there an outer circle that is inclusive of all the other thing depending on if in that into into and almost said intuition intonation if i if i hear a different emphasis on a certain word i might ask about that one first or call as i noticed I noticed that you said frantically a little different than you said the rest of them. Can you tell me a little bit about what's happening there? What's, what is it about frantically that's driving some energy? Um, but um, my goal is to always let the client, oh, there's, a, there's an absolute, <laughs> my goal is to always let the, the client make that choice going forward because it's their life, it's their session. And in, in my thoughts, it's my job to empower them to be the authority in their life that in some way they've forgotten. They're letting other people, they're living for other people or they're letting other people direct their experience. Does that help, Vanita? Absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you. Absolutely. There's an absolute. That's our next, <laughs> that's our next section. Oh, and here we are. We are in absolutes now. So absolutes are totally logical fallacies. Are you beginning to see it? Not only the totally, but totally now used as a modifier. In the study of logic, absolutes cannot exist, which is an absolute statement, which is a paradoxical statement. It only takes one example that's outside of the absolute to break the absolutes. So this idea that we are generating from hyperbole, 
we're stating something because it feels like it happens all the time, but it's not. I never get ahead. Never. I always get burned. I don't want to be in this role forever. Every time I try, something happens. Or the other one, the tricky one, that doesn't sound like an absolute, but in a way it is, I can't do it. The idea there goes back to the past creating the future. On its face, the statement, I can't do it, presupposes an inability in the future. I can't. So why even try? And I've, I have like a little bit of a triggering thing on this now, and I'll own it. My go-to when I hear that is almost a reflexive kick, like when the doctor taps your knee and your leg goes out, of is it that you can't or you haven't yet? Because if, if coaching is about being in the moment, creating forward, and the client is speaking a limitation of belief of I can't, are they in the moment? Or are they living in the past of what has happened up to this moment and not taking full ownership of their ability to change outcomes here? And it rem as I'm even saying that, it reminds me of the, um, the quintessential um, cover ourselves statement that is at the end of every financial institution's commercial ever. And I will own that as a qualifier. Past results do not predict future gains. So we don't know. Yeah, we, we had a 70% over the past five years of income gain. Oh, but wait, this was a bad year. We don't know. That's what's happened up to this moment. How can we help our client come here rather than allow their sense of the past and who they've been up till now to no longer control how they're creating the future from that that same sense of limitation that came into the ideally versus um, realistically. They might be based in our negativity bias. Your car always breaks down when we have somewhere important to be. That one is mine. And I'll take <laughs> from experience about 10 years ago, when my wife and I were dating at that point in time, and I drive a Jeep Wrangler, so you can take the cars off, take the cars off the door, take the doors off the car, so it doesn't have one of those little things that goes ding 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 if you leave your headlights on. At the time, living in the Midwest in Kansas City, sometimes the mornings start off a bit cloudy. I'd be driving to work, need the headlights for the first half of the drive, and then the clouds burn off and just forget that they're on. Walk out the end of the day, click, 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 click. Now I have to find a ride, get somebody to drive me to the parts store, get a new battery, change it. Invariably, that would happen when my wife and I had somewhere to be that was important to her. We had a concert to go to or a dinner to attend. We were going out with friends, and now I was going to be late. In my defense, in a period of about three, two and a half to three years, it happened four times. I have the receipts to prove it. Because there was an emotional connection on her part and mine, I, I, won't, I won't push all the ownership, but there was an emotional connection to that importance of the event that we be on time. When it happened the fifth time, or even when it happened the fourth, what do you think the statement was? You're always, you're always draining your battery. It's only been three times right now. That hyperbole comes forward from, from the emotional connection. And in my defense, it happened once about five years later. A five-year gap. What do you think I heard? And there was a three-year gap until the most recent one, which happened last year. The wording shifted just a bit to, you always used to do that. So there's still a bit of qualification, but at least the recognition of progress, which I truly appreciate. And that's where the absolute might come in. It's like this idea that it gets burned in because of an emotional connection to either experience or desired outcome it can also come from a sense of attachment to certain experiences. I always cry at weddings, 
but they're mostly happy tears. I'm not sobbing in sorrow. I'm really happy. And all the emotion comes for, but it, it's at every wedding. So what is, what could be the inquiry into the individual's perception of the absolute as reality might bring forward that underlying emotion that's actually creating their expression and their experience of how it applies in their life as something that's always going on or never going on when it's just an event and other events take place and then a similar event takes place again. So since we're you know, in our space, we, challenge, we help challenge reality in a kind way, an unattached way. Since they're fallacies, it's important to challenge them to bring a balanced perspective. The simplest way, simplest way, is to just ask the absolute as a question. I never have great relationships. Never. Slight tilt up in the vocal and then let the silence sit. Let them consider that idea. Now, did you also notice the adjective in that? Never have great relationships. Maybe there could be an exploration there of well, tell me what kind of relationships you do have if you never have great ones. Maybe that's something to build out. You, you get a double ding ding on this one. <laughs> Go either way. Which one feels the most? It might be, again, intonation. I never have great relationships. There, they're, they're pushing the, the adjective versus I never have great relationships. We might go with the adjective, with the uh, absolute. So another tool is challenging for definition. I don't want to be stuck in this job forever. Well, that's a really long time until the universe actually burns out and goes to absolute zero. So what do you mean by forever? Oh, like another four or five years. Okay. Now we're not talking being stuck in the tunnel with absolutely no light. Again, bringing an absolute quality to it. Now maybe there's a sense of I, I just need to put my head down and do the work for four or five years, and that feels more manageable. I can get through it. Or, all right, I don't want to be in this role for four or five years. What are the actions I can take to either get promoted or look elsewhere for the new thing that fulfills me more? It's no longer about this imposition of weight of something that will go on until either the person exits the planet or the universe comes to an end which would be after the sun burns out. So they probably would just be there. The forever would just be until the sun burns out. So if we bring that qualification to it. Timing is looking good. Let's say your client uses both absolutes and adjectives to describe their dilemma. I am always taking care of everyone else. I can never find enough time to take care of my needs. Where would you go first and why? And there's no wrong answers. So we'll just throw this one to the room or maybe I'll say wrong answers only. Where would you go? And how would you start? I'm always taking care of everybody else. I never find enough time for my needs. And um, Juanita here, uh, in case you find time, what would you like to do? Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, going with the qualification of time. So bringing that, that's one I hear a lot when clients get into the that hyperbole, I can never find enough time. It feels like I need five hours a week and it's just not there. But when we really boil it down, 15 to 30 minutes a day suddenly becomes very manageable. But in the, I don't have enough time for myself, it's this big thing that just, it's, it's wider than my calendar pages right now. It will not go in there. Mm-hmm. Other ideas? I love coaches who can hold the silence. That is the hardest skill to teach. I just want to put that out there. Thank, that's awesome. Is it jazz? Go ahead, jazz. Yes. Hi, Daniel. Yes. Hello. Uh, hello. A uh, lovely session. And very interesting question. For some reason, I think my inclination would be to ask about what is this need that you're talking about that I am not able to take care of my needs? What are your needs? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. What are, let's bring a qualification to needs that that might open up the time required. So in a, in some ways, notice what we're doing here. We're, we're bringing this I, these ideas of absolutes and also needs, which is like an I want to be rich statement, to almost 
almost like a facilitation of SMART goals, getting specific, measurable, um, realistic, time bound to make make the idea or the experience quantifiable that then we could begin taking action on it in life. Yep. Awesome. Other ideas? Or any other questions from any segment? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking we could start to inquire about the feeling behind such a emotive statement. There's a lot, there's so much that could be unpacked there. So really what's the feeling the underlying feeling. Mm -hmm. Yep, that would be a deep dive into the into the personal experience right away. I'm hearing the never. I'm hearing the always. What what's coming up for you emotionally as you're sharing that? I'm I'm picking up some energy on it. Yes, absolutely. GC, go ahead. Uh, okay. Uh, um, there was a statement like uh, I never have good relationship or something like that. So I never have uh, great relationships. Yeah. Yeah. So now uh, that has been his experience and he's predicting the future. So that is his belief. Now, uh, what do we do? Means uh, let him drive, let him uh, make a resourceful state for the future or we tell how do we want to be or how, how do we move from that to future? So it could go a couple different directions there. Um, it might be the, so you never have great relationships. We could either explore what has been up to the moment that I, and there's debate on that. I don't like going to the past. Like, so what kind of relationships are you experiencing would be where I'd, I'd want to stay here. And even that I'm a little bumpy on, but we might need the bookend. Tell me about, tell me about great relationship. What, what is this thing you're not getting? And then we're defining the future state. I I personally do not like questions to the past. It, it's mm -hmm. it's just one of my things. Every now and then, I'd I'd rather it bubble up from the client as they touch back on what has been. My personal preference is to be here now, creating forward, and not go on. So, what did you do the last time? The, the, now, I also want to call something to the room here because I challenged the ICF on this. In the eight sample questions for the ICF exam, question number seven, and I'm, I am not that big of a geek on this. I just happen to teach it so many times that it's there. Question number seven is the one on um, the metaphor of the runner. And the answer for the best solution is something like, is the... The client is writing a book on running. They are an experienced marathon runner and they've come in saying they've hit a wall. So they're using the metaphor of hitting a wall as a runner, which is when you just burn out and it feels like you're, you're pushing against a wall. The best answer is ask the client if there was ever a time when they were running a marathon and they experienced something similar. That is a clear throw to the past. And I actually wrote, I actually wrote to the ICF and said, so excuse me, if coaching is supposed to be in the present going forward, help me understand this. I get where it's the only one that embraces the metaphor, but it is a clear call to the past versus being in the present. And you could actually write it these five ways, which were all answers in the present, because I'm that big of a jerk. And they said, yes, and our definition of therapy space in this of exploring the past is exploring the emotional past. And now as I'm saying that, I'm recognizing the adjective in that. You can pull a success state forward. What did you do before? How can we apply that now? Which also seems like a little bit of fixing. Like if, if that was already there, they would do it by now. And that's another reason I don't like asking those questions because the next no brainer is to say, well, why don't you just do that thing now? And uh, thank you for paying for the hour and I'll see you next week. Um, maybe, but I, I would prefer those experiences to come up conversationally from the client of, you know, this happened to me before. What's important about that memory now? And how is that memory impacting what you're experiencing for us to move forward and maybe change that? Let let them have it come up and then we stay in the moment going forward. That seems to be, to me, to me feels more powerful. 
So um, I think I sidebarred on your question, but am I answering it? Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, very much so. So tell me about great relationship. How would, what would a great relationship be like? Um, how is, and then maybe we go to, how's that difference to, than what you've experienced up to now so we can create a gap? And who do you have to be for that based on how you've shown up up until now? And now we're, now we're back to the person building. I mean, we are about top of hour. Look at that. Wonderful oh, timing. Awesome. <laughs> So Dan, we have a question in the chat uh, that Neha has put in, who's saying, okay. who would you be as someone who takes as much care of oneself as of others? Ooh, that's a good question. Sorry, that's not a question. That was just my response to, uh, uh, Yeah. I cannot find yeah. for myself what, yeah, yeah, that's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you, that that idea of ownership, you're, you're, the investment you're putting in others, who would you be if you put that investment in yourself? There's another question of supreme ownership. Um, because how many times have you heard that from a client, particularly the clients who are in the giving fields? Because they, they and I'm, I'm making a really broad brushstroke on this, those who are called to be of service to others we, and I'm saying we here because I get caught up in it, tend to make ourselves available all the time and that battery drains. And then we're not showing up as effectively for ourselves, recognizing that I give best when this cup is pretty much full and I need to know where my red line is so that I can recharge and be be ready to, to give to the next person. Um, yeah, who would you be? And then maybe it turns into what permission do you need to give yourself to do that? Yep. When you say yes to something, what else do you say no to? Uh-huh. comes into a very binary space because you can, <laughs> it, it, there's no maybes. That That's a big one. Um, and let's talk about that since we have a couple of moments in client choice. They're, they're, choosing to take, in theory, new and different actions. There's that quote from Einstein that, um, or no, not Einstein, the colloquial definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So if they don't want the same results that they've received up to this moment in life, what do they need to do differently? That's stepping outside the comfort zone, taking risk, having courage, doing something uncomfortable, all that stuff that expands the comfort zone. There's no maybe in that space. Listen for the softball words when the when he's like, so what is what is your homework? What are your actions in the next week? Well, maybe I'll make that phone call. Maybe. Or the worst one, the one that really slides through is I'll try to. I'll try to call them on Wednesday. Is that that you'll try to call them or you'll try on Wednesday? Help me get some clarity. When are you actually going to call them? Um, those are not words of commitment. They're hedges. And what tends to happen, particularly in personal communication, if I say I'll try to do it, what I'm really thinking is I'm looking for any excuse not to. And the other person is saying, they're going to move heaven and earth to make that happen. I am so proud of them. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. <laughs> so challenge in those moments, because that's when you can really be of service to your client. Adjective, adverb, really be of service. You're already being of service. Help them to come into that space of recognizing, are they hedging? And step more actively into creating the next thing. How would you like to take care of yourself? Yes, again, bringing that definition to what is this thing of my needs and everybody else's stuff? Let's bring quantification to it so we can begin finding that navigation of where does it fit and how often on the calendar for how long. Any other questions? Comments? Kenneth, I think I can throw over to you. I just have two slides to close out, but we're I think we're at a spot to check in. Yeah, maybe maybe it's a good time, Dan, that I'm, I'm just going to run a small survey uh, for the feedback. So I'll get that going while Okay, yeah. 
Um, yes. I some for some reason I don't see the poll <laughs> on my screen anymore. If you could uh, run that poll for me, thank you. Oh, curious which one you would address in the last question, always or never. It might depend on if one seems to have more energy in it. I might ask into that if I've, I heard a different energy in the always versus the never, tell me which one. Or, excuse me one sec. I might just ask the client. So I'm hearing two absolutes here, the always and the never. Which one would you like to explore first? and let them make the choice. Uh, can I pass a comment now? So that's a... Sure. Yes, please. Uh, so uh, when you, uh, so apart from whatever content you have, presented when you speak uh you speak from the whole body it seems it's not like the voice alone is coming so uh i don't want you to answer but i'm just curious how do you do that i don't even know that i realized i was doing it um it might it might be from having a broadcasting background it might also be I taught a coaching program for six years. The first three years, I was live traveling the country and doing a three-day three day seminar, essentially. And I was in front of a room. And then when the world went on <laughs> shutdown, the world went on pause in 2020, we moved into a virtual. I think I took what I used to do in front of the room and became a bit more overly. Uh, uh, overly, I'm qualifying, overly animated. So this this energy could reach literally around the world in this case, um, so that the energy comes through this little device right here and builds that connection. Because it, the first couple, like, this is strange. I'm so used to feeling the room. Now I've, I've got to build in and push it out there. And I just love this stuff. I, I, I truly, I, I live and love this stuff. It's, it's my goal to help up level this industry because it's, it's in that almost what I call the terrible teens phase right now. This industry has been around for fifty years, but in the, in the past ten, it, be, it became more known, and particularly in the past four or five, now it's at that space of you get articles in the New York Times a few weeks ago that were not very glowing. And I got interviewed a couple of years back by a TV station in Los Angeles. And I could tell from the questions that were asked, it was initially very much of a buyer beware, even though the, the interviewer was a good friend of mine and did a very glowing report. A couple of the questions that were asked early were kind of buyer beware stuff. Like, okay, I see where this is going and I'm not going to bite. Um, because it's because it's an unlicensed field, the ICF and some other organizations are certainly bringing self-regulation. And the EU last year, year before, recognized the governing bodies as the regulators. There's still a lot out there that brings question, um, and you know it is what it is. I've I've met so many coaches who are not ICF credentialed, who are incredibly powerful coaches. So it's not just about this. It's about the person showing up in the role. And that, that means more to me than anything else. And let's, let's honor what coaching is as empowering the person in front of you and how you do that. Absolutely, Dan. And we've got some um, wonderful comments coming in the chat thank so you great grateful for that i think the one that i resonate with the most uh, is this perspective of thinking about words uh, in the way that you presented it it's as coaches we use it but just the context and for us to be now like for me individually i'll speak about myself to be more conscious around how these equations come into the play when we hear words from the client and their story so yeah 
Uh, so we have uh, maybe like, you know, a few more minutes with us, uh, six, seven minutes. Any questions, anything that you would like to ask? Let's can take I, this opportunity. Please, the... please, please, please go ahead. Daniel, thank you so much. See, I'm an entrepreneur who turned coach and I've been practicing coaching for the past three years. And involuntary, I mean, uh, I was in a HR leadership role where I was uh, into that, uh, not formally, but yes, got inducted into it. And now I'm practicing. No, I, I'm more into energy, being sort of a space. I never ever connected it to adverbs and absolutes. And involuntary, oh. we tend to do it, right? Involuntary, we tend to do it. And when uh -huh. I go and reflect on a session, I'm I'm very sure it, that's how it's going to get mapped. But I never thought about it. And the, thank you so much. So I can now see the mapping and I, I really like it. And any any uh, data, statistics, logics really, th you know, really thrills you, right? So. Uh -huh. So in that way, it was a very insightful session. Thank you so much. Um, and yeah, it was wonderful. A lot of takeaways. May I ask you a question? And it, it's a little bit of the, of going back to the absolutes, I heard, I never thought about it. Is it that you never thought about it or just hadn't thought about it up until now? <laughs> yeah, I, up until now, it was never. Now. But from now on, it's not going to be that. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, it's <laughs> We've got to start being careful with yeah. the choice of our words now. <laughs> I don't think so. I think it's good to be as we are and explore it as we go. <laughs> yeah. It, it was so funny. The first time I presented, there was one volunteer for a sample session. And I had to say to the room, I don't know. This is a very specific topic. And I don't know if it's going to show up. So I'm going to initially be hyper-focused, which is different than just being focused. Um, I'm going to be hyper-focused into this because that's the topic. But if it doesn't show up, I'm just going to broaden my listening and I'll facilitate a session. The, the volunteer client immediately in what, what's our, what's our topic tonight was discussing absolutes. And we explored those. And then what broke the session open was an adverb and it i could not have asked for a better demonstration particularly the very first time out to say okay this does work and there is something here for me to share with others and if we have one second i'm going to go into those last two slides to share um this is a quick close out and if if the icf thing is in your future if it's part of of your process. Um, I've put some free coaching resources on my website, including a PDF of how to break down and how to decode the exam questions for the best and worst answers. It's serious. Whoever thinks about doing the worst thing? It's like, smack my head moment. I don't know why they did that, but they did. It's just part of the exam. And you can find that information if you scan that QR code. But um, just going to my website, Transcendent Living, you will find it under the services tab for free coaching resources. I'll just leave that up for a couple more moments and then we'll bounce out. Melissa. Hi, yes, Daniel. I, I really want to ask you this question. Um, I'm just curious in the world of you know, absolutes, I think we can all recognize there's probably often a lot of feeling and emotion and history and layers and legacy behind some of these things. So I'm just wondering, how do you um, suggest managing things like, I think behind absolutes, you can have a lot of, um, maybe someone can be feeling quite defensive or quite def defeated by life. Um, when they start to really utilize these sorts of terms. So I just wonder how do you support them through that with your questioning? Because I have felt in some coaching sessions to potentially say, really never. And again, it is the way you say it, but sometimes that can feel affronting to someone who uh, who has that history behind whatever message they're giving. So I'm just curious about managing their potential defensiveness and defeated, defeated uh, feelings if if the energy is there so now it's not about the words it's about the presentation of the word 
and that that defeat like i never get ahead i would i would be less concerned about the languaging on it and lean more into the energy of like your energy your energy is different tonight than it has been in previous sessions or something changed when you said tell me what is happening for you and explore their present being rather than tapping into the languaging right away um because that way i'm honoring the person in front of me having an experience rather than challenging their perception of something that always or never happens which could definitely absolute definitely could lead to defensiveness brilliant thank you thank you're very you. welcome yeah, that, that reading of energy and noticing that's being right here in the moment. And that's when magic really can start to happen in a session as we shift from even a more transactional listening, like listening for the words. This, this is a bit of a transactional conversation of listening for qualification words. When we bring it, we hear them and also notice the energy in which they're spoken, we could open up a lot more. Mm, oh yes the hyperbole yes that that might be the next build out this this presentation is a chapter in the book that i'm currently writing on coaching um the, the chapter is even broader than what's here so um yeah that's that's a huge thing as we become more and more divisive particularly here in in the u.s i hate to say it's it's really an interesting what's what's that old curse may you live in interesting times Oh, I saw a mic open. Go for it, Anna. No, I was I was trying to. I, I unfortunately for you, it's not only on, in the U.S. Oh, <laughs> so okay. <laughs> I don't know if that makes you feel any better. I'm sure it doesn't, but uh, it's not only in the U.S. So, well, yeah. I suppose misery does love companies. So there is a true story. Bit, feel true a story. Bit better. <laughs> and also, you know, our brain is wired that way to search for any possible uh, attack so of mm -hmm. course we will tr we will uh, dig for misery so we can make our brain feel useful mm -hmm. and feel protected and feel like we've avoided yeah. the danger and stayed alive to pass our yeah. genes along to another generation for them to look for the negativity yay for us <laughs> yeah. all right kenneth thank you thank you yes. everyone thank <laughs> that was really nice <laughs> i love that <laughs> But yes, thank you so much, uh, everyone who stayed with us. And uh, Dan, special thank you. This is this was really, really awesome. Thank you, Neha, once again for the privilege of introducing us to Dan and him coming over. And we'd love for you, Dan, to come once again. We could uh, collaborate and partner again and ensure that you know we're just enriching this coaching community. So uh, with those words, uh, I think it's, we can say goodbye for now, but hope to come back again soon. So thank you everyone for your patience. On behalf of Coaching Journey community, I would like to just give a nice uh, warm welcome and a very quick picture, if uh, almost left my mind. Thank you, Yash. If I may request everyone to come on screen just for one good picture for all of us together. That would really be wonderful. And as, as the cameras come on, you take the picture, I will say, I, and I'm going to say an absolute in this, I am always here to yes. be of service to you and your community. So anytime, feel free. Gratitude. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, any, any more cameras on, please? All right, I'm going to take a click and um, hey, there, thank you. All right, on the count of three, three, two, one, smile, please. Thank you. Maybe one more. All right. Cheese, thank you. Perfect. Thank you, guys. This has been uh, wonderful. Thank you, Dan. And we will definitely uh, come back to you <laughs> once again. Wonderful. I look Good forward to it. Be well, everyone. Have a wonderful Thank evening. You. Take care. Bye, Take everyone. Care. Thanks. Bye. Take care, guys. Thank you.